Greetings, this is Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University, and this is my Site 487 Capstone History and Systems Lecture on Behaviorism. In the previous lecture, we gave uh, the antecedents to behaviorism leading up till today, and after this lecture, we'll be talking about neo-behaviorism, which is the new behaviorism which follows behaviorism, but here we are right smack in the middle. And so really, one of the key figures is something someone we've mentioned previously, John B. Watson, who lived from 1878 to 1958. Uh, John B. Watson's approach was definitely uh, quite revolutionary. He didn't want to make minor tweaks to structuralism and functionalism, gestalt psychology. He wanted to offer revolution revolutionary new ideas about how to study human behavior and to really turn psychology into the science of human behavior as he defined it. He did his undergraduate work at Furman University in South Carolina. He goes to graduate school at the University of Chicago. Um, by self-report and the writings of historians of the time, uh, Watson was not known to be a very good introspector, which might have been a very practical reason why he didn't want to, you know, uh, espouse uh, either functionalism or structuralism. And so it could very well have been a very utilitarian approach to revolutionize psychology because he wasn't good at, you know, one of the primary methodological approaches of the day. And so that's just a little bit of a background about Watson in his undergraduate years. Uh, after he graduates in 1903, he becomes an instructor at the University of Chicago. He's there for a while until 1908, where he's offered an assistant professorship at the University of Chicago. Uh, but he's also a full professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So he goes to Baltimore. Uh, he goes to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, which is a very famous university. And he's uh, hired by a psychologist who's famous in his own right, uh, J. Mark Baldwin. As you can see here on the screen, the co-founder of Psychological Review. He's the department chair. One year after he gets, after John B. Watson gets to uh, Johns Hopkins, Baldwin is forced to resign from the university due to a sex scandal. And the long and the short of it is uh, that Baldwin was caught in a police raid in a Baltimore brothel. You can imagine the newspapers at the time uh, made this into kind of a serialized story. Uh, it was quite a scandal. John B. Watson replaces him as chairman. This is kind of interesting little foreshadowing, not precisely the same scenario, but there's going to be somewhat of a sex scandal in John B. Watson's career. And so it's interesting to see that foreshadowed in Baldwin, who is the person who hires uh, Watson from the University of Chicago to come to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. John B. Watson in 1914 publishes the book Behavior and Introduction to Comparative Psychology, where he makes some very... Um, very cogent and persuasive arguments about the use of animals in research. Uh, very much continues on this functionalistic claim about comparative psychology and the value that we can see in studying animals as their behavior very often maps onto the behavior of humans. His dissertation that John B. Watson does at the University of Chicago is titled, there on the screen, Animal Intelligence, colon, the Psycho Psychical Development of the White Rat. And so psychic is in psychological, not as in psychic powers like ESP and clairvoyance and things like that. 1919, John B. Watson publishes Psychology from the Standpoint of a Behaviorist, where he makes it very clear that the methods used in animal studies are applicable to humans. And so uh, there's a nice comparative framework there for studying animals as a un means of understanding and gaining insight into human behavior. All right, so the personal story comes into play here. Now, as part of that personal story, John B. Watson's married, but he falls deeply in love with one of his graduate students, Rosalie Rayner, who's half of Watson's age. Now, Watson is ma married to someone named Mary Ix, who's actually very well connected in the Baltimore community at the time. If I'm remembering this correctly, I believe Mary Ix's father is like the mayor of Baltimore. And so John B. Watson's part of this very prominent family in Baltimore. The scandal breaks out, falls in love with a graduate student. She's half of Watson's age. He goes through a widely publicized divorce. His love letters are published in newspapers. It's a scandal of epic proportions at the time. Uh, John B. Watson is forced to resign from John Johns Hopkins University, just as his predecessor, J. Mark Baldwin, was forced to design, resign from a sex scandal at Johns Hopkins University. 
Um, and John B. and John B. Watson gets married to Rosalie Rayner in 1920, and he really that that is his exodus out of higher education. He'll have some connection to psychology after that point in time, but really the bulk of his contributions are going to happen in the 19. Tens, the teens, that is, uh, during that uh, decade uh, where his books are going to go on to live on and to influence behaviorists for decades, probably for at least four decades, to be honest. So his second career after the 1920s, and he's forced out of Johns Hopkins University as the department chair, is in advertising. And essentially, uh, John B. Watson applies the principles of operant and classical conditioning that are emerging out of psychology at during this era into the philosophy of advertising on Madison Avenue. And so the idea was that people are machine-like, and you can predict and control behavior. Uh, the science and the study of human behavior is precisely what psychology was all about. And so you can see some of the examples here in the bullets. And so some of the ideas and notions that Watson popularized within the advertising world was to focus on style rather than substance and advertising message. Uh, this is a this is a kind of a, a, a cute little purpose of advertising here to keep everyone reasonably dissatisfied with what he has in order to keep the factory busy making new things. And so if that car was still running and someone came home next door with a new car, the, this notion of keeping up with the Joneses and and uh, even though it might the old car might be working just fine, you see someone that has something else and you try to make them reasonably dissatisfied so that they will aspire to buy something new that perhaps before uh, they actually need that new item. Uh, John B. Watson is a pioneer with regard to celebrity endorsements and also used fear tactics to as a motivator in terms of classical and opera conditioning to sell things ranging from automobiles to underarm deodorants. And if you go back and you look at the at the history of such things, even even ideas like uh, bathing, uh, it wasn't a daily event like most people consider it today. You might have taken a bath uh, every few every other day or so, or maybe once a week on a Saturday night. And so now all of a sudden, if you have people being fearful that their underarm perspiration might have an odor to it, then you sell deodorant. And then you create this fear, this perception that will ultimately help sell a product. And and Watson's one of the pioneers in actually taking this notion uh, and looking at the motivations within psychology to help sell products on Madison Avenue. Um, 1928, although Watson's out of psychology properly, he's still contributing to psychology. Uh, he's actually asked to write uh, for many different local newspapers in terms of a, a column, or sort of like a Dear Abby column that we might have seen in the 20th century. 1928, he writes a book, Psychological Care, I'm sorry, Psychological Care of the Infant and Child. It gives very stern puritanical advice on child raising. I'm going to give you a minute here to read this paragraph. But look at what Watson suggested to parents that they should and should not do. I'm just going to go ahead and let you read that. Here's the thing. People followed this advice, and so, and he wasn't the only person of the era giving this type of advice. And in all honesty, depending on what your age is and the age of your family members, you might be able to think back to a father, a grandfather, or even perhaps a great grandfather who might very well have been raised this way and then raised his or her own children this way. And so, this very stern, puritanical, very uh, hands off, uh, avoid high emotion, don't be maudlin, don't be emotional with your children. A generation of kids are raised under these conditions. And finally, in 1930, he revises his uh, classic book, Behaviorism. And that's really going to be his last psychology-related activity. Madison Avenue takes over more. Uh, you can see, though, that John B. Watson lives 28 more years until he dies in 1958. And so in the 1920s, Watson stays connected to psychology through his writings, through his newspaper articles, uh, through his utilization of psychological principles on Madison Avenue. But 1930 is really going to be his last formal contribution to psychology proper. Really, you know, and so again, the 19, 1910s, you know, from 1910 to 1919, 1920, really, 
are going to be Watson's chief contributions before he's ousted as chair of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And so in 1913, you can see here, uh, he, he writes a very famous psychological review article, Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. And so what Watson does here quite clearly and cleanly is that he gives behaviors in the name, behaviorism. He really sets out to... Uh, be unambiguous as to what uh, behavior studies, the theoretical nature, uh, the methodology. I mean, just kind of walk through this phrase. It's purely objective, experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goals, prediction and control of behavior. Introspection has no place in behaviorism, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness by which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. So introspection is out as a methodology of behaviorism. The behavior, remember that Watson wasn't very good at it either, so that's kind of a happy coincidence. Uh, the behaviorist in his efforts to get a unitary scheme of animal behavior recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. And so, again, the importance of comparative psychology and animal psychology and giving insights into human behavior is very much in the forefront here. The behavior of man with all its refinement and complexity forms only part of the behavior's total scheme of investigation. And so really clear, precise, um, demonstrative terms. Psychology, as the behaviorist views it, is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior, period. I mean, this really is that revolutionary call to arms. We're not going to tweak functionalism or structuralism. We're going to overturn those and have this brand new flavor of psychology become, uh, in its heyday, really, from the 1920s and the 1960s, between behaviorism and neo-behaviorism dominating the American landscape in psychology. One of the characteristics that makes Watson's behaviorism revolution, if you will, just so um, defined in the history of psychology is that he was very clear about what behaviorism was and was not going to be. And so Watson articulated this behaviorism manifesto in the following points. And so Watson made it very clear in his early works in 1913-1918 that psychology is the science of behavior and not the study of consciousness. Uh, he separates, by the way, uh, introspection is no longer uh, a method of psychology, according to Watson and behaviorism. Psychology becomes a branch of the natural sciences, which is uh, a very strong departure from psychology's roots in the Department of Philosophy, for example. The human-animal continuity and continuum is uh, made present in Watson's behaviorism. Human and animal behavior is investigated. They are two ends of the same continuum, and animal psychology becomes uh, highly sought after in terms of understanding human behavior. So again, this notion of a comparative psychology approach is clear in behaviorism. The true behaviorist, the strict behaviorist, is going to discard all mentalistic concepts and stick to really the SR that we talked about in the lecture on antecedents to behaviorism, the stimulus response psychology. And really, if you talk to behaviorists, and there are actually behaviorists still around today who would claim this very strict approach, not very many, but there are some, what they would really say is that we, we believe in the idea of mind and consciousness, but that, but that they're just not the purview of psychology. So you can talk about internal mental states all you want, but they're not appropriate for psychological science. That would be the approach of most behaviorists and neo-behaviorists today. So in Watson's behavior as a manifesto, the goal was, you know, there's no consciousness, there's no mind, there's no cognition, there's no higher mental processes, you know, decision-making. That stuff may all exist, but it's really not within the realm of psychology. Psychology should just leave those concepts alone. And really this notion of extreme environmentalism is that it's the environment that shapes the behavior of an organism. And so if you give me complete control over the environment, then I can manipulate that situation such that certain behaviors are bound to emerge. And so it really is this, this essential notion of stimulus response psychology, that the stimulus in the environment elicits the response from the organism with the organism having little to no control over it. Again, this would be the approach that the behaviorist would take.
And finally, you know, the goal of uh, Watson's behaviorism is the prediction and control of behavior. And so still, even into the 1920s, there's really not a strong focus at all on what we would call today clinical or counseling psychology. Psychology really isn't founded as one of the helping professions, nor is it really its main focus in the 1920s. There are people within psychology at the turn of the 20th century who are interested in helping behaviors in the helping profession, but it's not widespread at all, not, a, not at all like it is today. And so this, you can see these subpoints, these bullets here, really make from a strong departure and demarcation from what had come before in terms of Wundtian psychology, structuralism, functionalism, even Gestalt psychology, some of the alternatives and antecedents, and then behaviorism. Behaviorism draws a line in the sand. This is what psychology is. Here's what it isn't. We're going to be psychologists. Here's my bat and ball. I'm going to run home and, and, and play with other kids unless you play by my rules. And this was really the dominant force in psychology, that is behaviorism, from the 1920s to about the 1960s or so when the cognitive revolution kicks in. And finally, one last, I'm sorry, one last component to Watson's behaviorism manifesto. Because we have this continuum of animal to human, then we have child rearing becomes. And so, again, there's the developmental stages in there where we can learn from different parts of the organism and developmental stages. Therefore, uh, we can actually start to apply psychology more broadly just beyond the introspective laboratory and so we have this application to social problems such as child rearing and then Watson in the 1920s after he leaves psychology still continues to dabble in that writing for popular newspapers and publishing and then revising books that he had written earlier on and so forth and so there's really a, a vast departure here a revolutionary change from what had happened in psychology prior to the onset of behaviorism. This behaviorism approach uh, gained wide appeal because if you rely on the environment for the possibility of achievements and things that you can do in your life and you minimize the role of heredity uh, and, and hereditary instincts and, uh, and inherited traits, then what happens is that it's, it has wide appeal. It gives people hope. It's the American dream. It goes right along with baseball and apple pie and, and all the other things that go along with Americana. And so if you think, think about this from an environmental perspective, if I can arrange the environmental stimuli in a certain way, I can get responses that can lead to the type of person I want them to create. Now, when you and I read this paragraph, it is certainly with hyperbole, but I, I think to a large extent, Watson meant this. And I should mention to you, this is probably one of the most famous quotations in all of psychology. And so even though I know you can read it and you're probably done reading it on the screen after hearing me babble on about it, it's just so much fun for someone who cares about psychology. I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you anyway. Give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief, regardless of his talents, pensions, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. If you just actually stop and think about that for a minute, no matter where you came from, no matter what your background, no matter who your parents or grandparents are, the message of behaviorism in the 1920s gave people hope. Uh, it gave people an alternative to what was coming out of the Victorian area in Germany and Austria of the Freudian notion and sexuality. And all of a sudden now, this, this notion of Watsonian behaviorism gave people hope, created proper environment, and your children can grow up to become anything, anything they want to become. And this was very popular. And you can imagine how newspaper articles wanted to run columns by behaviorists about how to you know, improve child rearing. And, you know, this is where all the Dr. Spock stuff comes out of in the 1930s and 40s and all the advice books uh, that continue on in pop psychology to this day come out of some of these you know, very fundamental behaviorist traditions.
Watson's also very popular for his experimentation with Little Albert. Uh, and by the way, this, these experiments that happened in the 1920s with Rosalie Rayner at his side have become under a great deal of scrutiny here in the last five years or so. There's been a great deal of scholarship that's gone back to try to actually trace Little Albert and who he was and, and where he came from, as well as the conditions under which Albert was uh, in. Was he a healthy infant to begin with? And so there's actually a, a ton of scholarship emerging here in the early 2010s about um, uh, about uh, the influence of little Albert and Watson's role in interacting with that child. Um, another reason for the popular appeal that I mentioned earlier in the previous slide is that it was an alternative to Freud. And we have this notion of sex and sexuality in the, uh, coming out of this Victorian era in the 1890s out of Germany and in, in the U.S., and now all of a sudden, you know, there's this, uh, you know, you, you hear, think about the roaring 20s and going on in the United States and prohibition. And so this notion of behaviorism kind of was very appealing to a lot of Americans because it was kind of a take control of your own situation. Uh, yes, the environment makes a difference. Yes, we can overcome uh, heredity and you don't have to be born into famous parents or a wealthy family to become wealthy yourself. And it was a very popular, centrist type of message that appealed to a lot of Americans at the time. 1920s, you saw the outbreak of psychology. Now, I've already mentioned this a couple of times. There were a ton of newspaper columns who had psychologists as regular contributors. Um, individuals in the 1920s, and you can imagine, especially at the end of the 1920s when the Great Depression hits in October of 1929, that some thought that psychology was the path to health, happiness, and prosperity. And so psychology became very popularized in the 1920s, and this obviously coincides with Watson and behaviorism and the popularity that he gains and the movement gains uh, through these very uh, appealing ideas. Um, as there is with any system of psychology, there are criticisms of behaviorism. Um, its objectivity is too extreme to, to others. Uh, you know, the notion of behaviorism rules out sensation and perception because if it's not a objectively observable by others and publicly available and measurable and quantifiable, well, therefore, it, it's not the purview of psychology. And, of course, the people who want to study, you know, how the retina works and how the brain works and neuron, neuronal transmission and the synapses and all that good stuff about brain behavior relations are kind of ruled out. They're by, de by default, they're defined away as no longer being the study of psychology. And, you know, the dominant system of the time to some extent, kind of gets away with that in the 1920s throughout the 1960s. Um, some folks of the time, especially I would imagine the, the Gestalt psychologists and other alternatives to behaviorism that exist during the same time, uh, believe that those innate and tendencies are important, that uh, behaviorism trivially trivialized behavior, that we are more than just an accumulation of stimulus response associations. Uh, again, uh, other psychologists wanted to ask about, you know, what about thoughts and feelings and emotions, higher mental processes, cognitions, problem solving, decision making. And so again, the uh, behaviors of the time are going to define it away. And they're not going to say those things don't exist. They're just going to say, that's not what psychologists study. If you want to be a psychologist, you study stimulus response and the environment and how uh, the environment influences behavior and how we can shape environments to produce the type of people and the type of situations that we want to have. Um, the use of verbal report is criticized in behaviorism. And so, um, uh, you know, we have to rely on people's uh, you know, re verbal reports about their feelings and emotions. And so uh, the type of data collection, data analysis um, is going to be a criticism of behaviorism. Uh, there's a very specific psychologist, McDougall, who comes along in the 1920s, 1930s, um, and, and has um, his own flavor, if you will, his own departure from uh, the Watsonian behaviorism, which we'll call the McDougall brand of behaviorism. And you can see the bullets here on the screen as you're following along with me. Uh, McDougall believed that behaviorism was purposive. It was goal-driven, driven by instincts. He agreed that with Watson that psychology should be the science of behavior, which is part of the definition that exists to this day. Um, he thought that behavior was more spontaneous and variable. It doesn't require a stimulus. Sometimes organisms, that would be us, we just react and respond without some sort of externally identifiable stimulus. 
uh, that we are goal driven and we cease to be goal driven when the goal is attained and so there is some reinforcement mechanisms there in place. The behavior becomes more effective with practice. Uh, that's used, there are useless aspects of behavior which are, which are gradually eliminated. In other words, trial and error works. And so as we make errors and we get better and more proficient over time, the errors become fewer, we become, become more proficient, we make fewer errors, we are quicker at uh, accurate tasks. And that uh, behavior is not always uh, stimulated by the environment, but also by there are, there's some instinctual energy. We have some internal workings which motivate us rather than just being waiting to be externally stimulated by the environment with regard to a stimulus response situation. There really there are some classic debates that went back and forth between Watson and McDougall, and I think I've got the text here. This is the last slide here in this in in this. Uh, presentation, but this was a, a, a debate that McDougall and Watson had in February 1924. It gets published in 1929. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to be quiet here for a second and let you read it, but it really kind of crystallizes some of the criticisms of behaviorism. I'm going to let you read it, and then I'll come back for one final comment. I think this is a fantastic quote from this uh, from this McDougall Watson debate, and, and what I really like about it is that if you take behaviors into the extreme, then you have to talk about you know cat gut you know being you know run across you know the strings of a violin or the strings of a cello or something like that, and so what happens is that you know taken to the extreme it seems kind of silly. Uh, there are clearly some beneficial aspects to behaviorism that that last with us to this day, but this is a pretty strong and striking criticism of behaviorism that was uh, mentioned in 1924 and published in 1929. That's it for me for behaviorism.